Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Shadin Dufmi. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a, a PhD student at Stanford, uh, advised by Tim Rafkarnan. Uh, he works in the area of uh, algorithmic game theory, in particular mechanism design, and he's going to tell us about the power of randomized mechanisms. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm going to start with an introduction. So I'm motivated by the following question. When can we uh, allocate uh, scarce resources uh, efficiently uh, to get a socially desirable outcome? Can we do it in the presence of both selfish behavior and computational limitations? So there's a computational constraint. Uh, I have polynomial time to calculate what I'm going to do, how I'm going to allocate resources. And there's an economic constraint. I have uh, selfish behavior in, uh, that controls my input. So uh, resource allocation problems that involve selfish agents are uh, everywhere. And as systems grow larger, uh, also computational issues become more and more important. So the, there's going to be a, a challenge to reconcile the two. <clears throat> OK. So um, let me start by introducing mechanism design via a canonical example. So many of you have seen this before. Uh, let's say you have an item to sell. Let's say I want to sell my car. Uh, let's say there's a bunch of people that have interest in my car, interest in buying my car. Uh, so a commonly employed solution is uh, called the Vickery auction. It's the following three-step process. Um, so in the first step, I ask players for bids, which is basically a dollar amount that's uh, a proxy for how much they value my car. right? And then uh, I give the uh, item to the highest bidder. So uh, this lady bids 4000 so she gets the car. And then I uh, charge this lady $3,000 because the uh, next highest bid is $3,000. That's like a commonly employed solution. It's called the Vickery auction or the second price auction. Uh, so what happens in such a thing? Uh, in order for me to predict what's going to happen in such an auction, I need a way to model players' utilities. So uh, I'm going to assume that play each player has a valuation uh, visa buy for my item, which is basically a dollar amount that uh, represents how much they value the car, for example. And a player's utility uh, from the auction is their value for the car if, uh, minus the price they pay if they win, uh, or it's also zero if they lose, because they pay nothing and they get nothing. Right? So um, I'm going to assume a player is rational in that he chooses the bid that maximizes his utility. So he has a valuation. Um, and uh, uh, he has a utility, uh, and the bid is going to not necessarily be equal to the valuation, but it's going to be chosen strategically. So here's a fact about the Vickery auction. It's truthful in the sense that uh, for, every, uh, for every player, uh, bidding, uh, their, value, their bid equals their value is uh, the, best, th is the best, th best thing they can do. That's how they maximize their utility. Equivalently, uh, truth-telling, we say, is a dominant strategy. It's uh, basically, uh, you, they would always, it's always in their best interest to tell the truth, no matter what everybody else is doing. That's a property of the Vickery auction that I'm not going to prove. Uh, given this property, I can predict what the, what's going to happen in the Vickery auction. Uh, a player who's rational is going to tell the truth. So the auction is going to get the, tr uh, the true values of the bids, and it's going to give the item to the player who values it most. And it's going to charge this player the next highest valuation, right? Because it's going to get the correct inputs. Here's another fact about the Vickery auction. It maximizes social welfare. What does that mean? Uh, social welfare is basically the total value derived by the players from the outcome. Uh, to see this, notice that the player who values the car the most gets the car, right? So in a sense, uh, the most value is created. That's what, the, the, in other words, social welfare is maximized. And this is what mechanism design uh, tries to do. Uh, in a, um, gen more generally, it tries to basically figure out how to compute desirable outcomes from uh, preferences of selfish players. It tries to extract information and do the computation simultaneously. And uh, the Vickery auction is an example of a mechanism, uh, which is a three-step process, a bidding step, an allocation step, where you compute the outcome, who gets what, 
and a payment step where you charge people payments uh, to kind of incentivize uh, proper behavior. And uh, notice that uh, a player's, uh, a player's uh, utility is um, basically uh, determined by what happened in the second step and in the third step. So they're going to choose what they do in the first step to optimize what's going to happen there. Questions? Uh, here's a third fact. Um, the Vick reaction is obviously uh, something you can write code to do in uh, polynomial time, right? Because it's basically just computing the maximum of n numbers, right? Now, uh, it's, things become more interesting when the uh, com computing the outcome involves solving a more complicated problem. Maybe there's more than one item. Maybe there's uh, interdependencies between them. Um, and that basically makes the problem harder and harder and maybe becomes NP-hard, right? So that's kind of uh, where me algorithmic mechanism design comes in. It's basically when you want to compute uh, desirable allocations of resources where uh, um, the preferences uh, of the players for the allocations uh, are private and the players are selfish. Uh, and moreover, you want to do it in polynomial time where the problem is maybe not, not uh, tractable. Right? Uh, so, okay, so uh, there's more complicated resource allocation problems where the computational challenge becomes more important. So let's look at some examples of these. I'm going to look at three examples that are going to be illustrative, and I'm going to tell you how we solve them all uh, during the course of this talk. Some I'm going to uh, explain in more detail than others. So uh, here's a problem. I'm going to call it the knapsack public projects problem. It's basically a strategic variant of the knapsack problem that we all know and love. You have a bunch of people who live uh, in a town, and there's a bunch of public projects that the town is considering building. So a bus station, a, a, a fire station, and a bridge. right? And there's a finite resource, let's say cement, right? There's 100 tons of it. And every project requires a certain amount of cement. And now every player has a value, which is in dollars, of how much uh, utility they derive uh, from every project if it were built, right? So maybe this guy would, be, uh, uh, would derive $200 worth of value if the bridge was built, for example. And uh, if I sum up players' values for a particular project, I get the total value to society of building that project. For example, in this case, the bridge is worth $500 to society, right? And I can do this for everything, and I get a dollar value for every public project that tells me how much society values it. Now, my goal is to basically maximize the total welfare to society. I want to pick a subset of these projects to build, given that I only have 100 tons of cement, and given that these are the player's values, right? Let's forget for now that the player's values are private. I'm just defining the problem, and then we can worry about extracting these values. Um, right, so I want to maximize the social welfare by building a subset of these projects. Um, and notice that this is basically just the uh, knapsack problem. As the number of project scores grows large, this becomes NP-hard. Because I have a resource constraint and I have values on the things, and I want to basically uh, build a subset such that it fits in the resource constraint of 100 tons of cement. Questions? All right, so it's NP-hard, but uh, it has an FP-TAS. Or uh, more simply, there's a 1 minus epsilon approximation that runs in polynomial time uh, for every epsilon. And it's also going to be polynomial 1 over epsilon, as we all, all know. Uh, OK, so here's another example. It's uh, called combinatorial auctions. It's one of the, motiva it's one of the um, most uh, studied problems in uh, mechanism design and algorithmic mechanism design. So you have a bunch of uh, people. And there, there's a bunch of items up for sale. Uh, volleyball net, volleyball, ping pong ball, and a ping pong paddle. Uh, so every player, uh, also known as bidder, has a valuation function, which is a, set, a function that maps subsets of the items to the real numbers. It basically tells you how much they value every bundle. Um, why am I defining this to be a set function? Well, maybe there's dependencies between the items. Maybe uh, if, I'm, if I'm this player on the left, Maybe uh, uh, my value for the uh, volleyball net and the volleyball together is greater than the sum of my values for each alone because they're complementary. I can only play volleyball if I have both, right? So that's why I define their valuations using these set functions. And my goal is to basically partition these items, partition these items between the players so as to maximize their welfare. Uh, and what does that mean? It's the sum for over all the players of their value for what they get. Make sense? Questions? Okay, 
So this problem is very hard uh, and hard to approximate if, um, if we don't assume anything about the structure of these uh, uh, valuation functions. So uh, I'm going to make, uh, for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm going to make assumptions about these valuations. The most common one is that they're submodular. What this means roughly is that the players have diminishing marginal returns over what they get. Essentially, my value for an additional item is a decreasing function of what I already have. Right? Which is uh, natural. Um, for example, um, if I, my value for the uh, volleyball and the ping pong paddle is going to be less than the sum of my values for each alone because I don't have enough time to play both. Right? Okay, so now even if I assume the player's values are submodular, the problem is still NP hard, but now I get a 1 minus 1 over E approximation algorithm. Because this is essentially, uh, uh, if you've seen it before, this is maximizing a submodular function subject to a matroid constraint. It's not obvious to see that, but uh, trust me. Right? Questions? All right. OK, let me, let's look at a, even a third example. Right? So this is called combinatorial public project. It, shares, uh, it has similarity to each of the problems we talked about before. So um, you have a bunch of players and, again, a bunch of projects you want to build. Um, each player now has a set function that tells you how much they value if these projects were built, right? So maybe uh, um, uh, my value for the train station and the bus station together is less than the sum of my value for each alone because I either take the bus or the train to work, right? Um, and my goal is to pick a most k, where k is some, con some, some fixed uh, number, right? Um, I want to pick a most k of the projects, say half of them or whatever, uh, in order to maximize social welfare, because maybe I, I only have so many k bulldozers and I can only build k of them, right? And uh, now in this case, social welfare, it's the sum over all the players of their value of the set of projects that's built. And again, this is highly inapproximable, so I'm going to assume their values are submodular, and this uh, models a lot of interesting cases. For example, uh, if you forget about the rebuilding public projects, uh, the problem of designing the, which overlay nodes in a, uh, in a, in a network are the best to build for people uh, who are trying to route things is also kind of uh, an instance of the same idea, right? So this models a whole bunch of things. Uh, so it's still NP hard if I assume submodularity, but no, also has a one minus one review approximation. So I just told you like three problems that uh, kind of have similarities, but they all share like kind of a lot of common elements, right? In a sense, uh, this is these are all special examples of a class of welfare maximization problems. And these problems are everywhere. Whenever you want to allocate resources uh, and different agents have a stake in the outcome, uh, you get such a problem. And uh, it can be stated abstractly over a as a bunch of players, a bunch of solutions, and a map uh, for each player for how much they like every solution. And you want to basically find the solution that maximizes welfare. So you can state it very abstractly. And this is a large class of problems. So for all these problems, the economic work is basically done, right? There's a, there's a solution uh, that basically gives us all the economic properties we need. Uh, it's called the vickery clark groves mechanism. Many of you have seen it before, I assume. Um, and um, it's basically the following three-step process. Uh, you basically ask players for how much they value every possible outcome. Right? Then you find the solution that basically maximizes social welfare according to what they tell you. So uh, in the first step, they may not tell you the truth but you're going to optimize using whatever they tell you, right? And then um, you're going to charge every player his externality, which is basically, according to their purported valuations, you're going to uh, charge every player the increase in the happiness of others if he drops out, right? So you're going to basically force him to internalize how much he hurts everybody else. I'm not going to say this more uh, rigorously, but uh, essentially it's basically you're charging him for the amount of harm he, he causes others by being in this, in this uh, in this problem, right? What is omega? Uh, sorry, uh, omega is the, uh, um, uh, is the set of uh, solutions of the welfare maximization problem. For example, in combinatorial auctions, it's the set of partitions of the items among the players. So I'm thinking of it as an abstract set of uh, possible allocations of resources. Other questions? Um, right. So, so I'm going to charge a player his externality. And uh, it's not too hard to see that this, this mechanism is a generalization of the single item auction we looked at before. 
Um, and here's a fact about it. It's truthful and it maximizes social welfare. Why is it truthful? Well, first of all, notice that if it is truthful, then it definitely maximizes social welfare. Because in the second step, it's explicitly using the reports to maximize uh, welfare according to these reports. So if they're the truth, it's finding the optimal solution. Right? Why is it truthful? Um, well, uh, here's the intuition. Paying the externality internalizes the welfare of others. Basi so now the result is that um, I, my utility and the welfare are basically bound together. The happier, I, the, the, more, the, more, the happier everybody else is, the more happy I am. Because the payments are basically uh, the rewarding me when pe other people are happy and uh, hurting me when other people are sad. Right? So um, if I'm uh, rational, I want to optimize my utility. And my utility is bound to the social welfare. So I'm going to uh, uh, bid whatever maximizes social welfare. And since this mechanism uh, maximizes on my behalf, I'm going to tell it the truth. Right? Questions? OK, but uh, if you're a computer scientist like me, uh, you have a problem with this, is that the second step is usually uh, asking you to solve an NP-hard problem, like, for example, in the cases we just talked about. So we can't implement VCG in polynomial time when the problem is NP-hard, when the uh, underlying optimization problem is NP-hard. OK, um, well, computer scientists have an answer to this kind of problems. Uh, we design approximation algorithms. Basically, they're algorithms that compute near optimal solutions. And we measure their quality using the approximation ratio in, a, in the worst case sense, which is basically the percentage of the optimal, object, uh, optimal welfare in the worst case input, right? For example, uh, in uh, combinatorial auctions, it's 1 minus 1 over E for the best approximation algorithms. Now, for many problems, we, uh, we, know the we have a rich theory of approximation algorithms. We know for a lot of cases uh, what the best approximation is you can get. Uh, and we have lower matching lower bounds that say something like if p not equal np, then you can't do better than this, right? Uh, but you know, there's a, problem, uh, there's a problem with that, is that most known approximation algorithms can't be converted to truthful mechanisms no matter how smart you are about designing, the way you, designing how you pay people, right? And there's fundamental reasons for that. And uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, touch on why that is uh, in the rest of the talk. OK, so, <clears throat> so now that we have a, a, an economic problem and a computational problem, um, we want to ask, can we, uh, can we combine the two, uh, the, two, uh, idea, the two sets of ideas from computer science and economics to get the best of both worlds? So we have the VCG that satisfies the economic constraint, but not the computational constraint, and vice versa for approximation algorithms. Uh, uh, and now we want a mechanism that's both truthful and runs in polynomial time and gives us a good solution to whatever problem we have, right? And again, we're going to measure the quality of a, uh, of a mechanism using its approximation ratio. And I'm going to ask, uh, what's the best approximation ratio I can get if I want an algorithm that's both truthful and polynomial time? And this was first suggested by Nissan and Ronan as a research agenda, and it's grown a lot since then. Questions? Right. So now this poses a philosophical question, which is, um, is polynomial time uh, mechanism design any harder than uh, non-truthful algorithm design? Can I always uh, get, if I get, get a, like a 50% approximation using an approximation algorithm, can I always make it truthful and still get a 50% approximation in polynomial time? And that's a philosophical question. Um, and uh, what you, the best answer you can possibly hope for is, uh, is a black box reduction that takes any alpha approximation algorithm, uh, say, for example, combinatorial auctions or whatever the problem is, and turns it into an alpha approximation algorithm that runs in polynomial time and is truthful. Right? That's the best thing you could possibly hope for. So. Um, in this talk, like I said, I'm going to focus on truthful mechanisms. I'm going to try and justify that on this slide. Uh, I could do other things. I c there's other ways to design mechanisms. There's mechanisms that are good in Nash equilibrium. There's mechanisms that are good in other solution concepts like Bayes-Nash. Um, why am I going to focus on truthfulness? Why, why, why restrict myself to truthfulness? Well, there's uh, advantages. First of all, truthfulness is a very nice solution concept. It's very worst case, in a sense. Uh, it frees the players from reasoning about others. Uh, for example, um, if I 
have a truthful mechanism for combinatorial auctions, right? And it gets a good solution. Uh, it gets a good uh, uh, solution by, uh, according to uh, uh, my measure of worst case approximation ratio. Then I, that guarantee holds uh, under a very minimal assumption about how people behave. The assumption is that um, people are rational. If they're rational, they're going to tell the truth. So, I'm, so basically, I'm done. I don't have to assume anything about how they're going to reason about what everybody else knows and how, how they're going to react to the actions of others. Basically, you don't have to worry about what else is going on in the system. I can guarantee to them that if you tell the truth, your utility is maximized. So it's a very worst case kind of, uh, kind of solution concept. Uh, but you know, there's disadvantages to focusing on truthful mechanisms. Maybe this assumption is too strong and restrictive. Maybe it's too strong to require that um, it's always in the best interest of everybody to tell the truth uh, no matter what, every, every, what anybody else is doing. Right? Maybe I can't get good positive results using this kind of... Uh, uh, constraint, right? Uh, but you know, I, ha I have a good answer to that second bullet. Uh, well, that's not an issue because this talk, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about positive results, how we can get this very desirable yet uh, a priori, uh, perhaps too restrictive uh, constraint on what we're going to design, right? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my uh, uh, contributions at a high level. Okay, so uh, first let, let me set things in context. Uh, consider the state of uh, the algorithmic mechanism design circa 2008, 2009, 2007. Um, there are huge gaps between the best polynomial time approximation algorithms and the best truthful polynomial time approximation mechanisms. Here are some examples, there's more. In combinatorial auctions with submodular bidders, the one we talked about before, the best approximation algorithm is 1 minus 1 over e, i.e. 63%. And the best truthful one was uh, logarithmic in the number of items. In combinatorial public projects, uh, the problem where you're trying to pick the best k projects to build, uh, it was 1 minus 1 over e versus uh, square root of the number of items, even worse. Right? And there's many more. Right? And it was thought that these difficulties, the fact that, the fact that you can't, you, we, don't, we can't seem to get uh, truthful mechanisms that are as good as the best approximation algorithms, these difficulties were thought to be fundamental. And often that was backed up by theorems. I'm going to elaborate on that soon. Right? My contribution is to realize that these impossibility results and the place we were stuck uh, was um, there was a loophole in all these kind of uh, impossibility results. And um, I designed uh, mechanisms that close the gap for these problems that I presented uh, and more. And uh, more conceptually, I designed general techniques where, that you can use to uh, uh, design uh, approximation mechanisms that get the optimal approximation ratio. Um, so here's some highlights of what we were able to do. For example, uh, so first, um, there's a general result that we got. I got with Tim Ruffgarden. Uh, it's a black box reduction uh, for a large class of problems with an FP task. So I look at a large class of problems that models a lot of interesting welfare maximization problems. And I say, OK, no matter what the problem is, Given black box access to a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, I can make it truthful. Uh, as an example of that was the knapsack public projects problem, where you're trying to we have a cement and a resource constraint, right? And a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, if you're not familiar with the term or if you don't remember it, here's the definition. I'm not going to read it out. It's basically the best kind of approximation algorithm you can hope for for an NP comp uh, hard problem, right? So essentially, uh, this is kind of a black box result that uh, converts very, very nice approximation algorithms to truthful mechanism. We would like to do it for arbitrary approximation ratios, but we're not there yet, right? That's the first step. OK, so combinatorial auctions uh, with submodular valuations, it's essentially uh, the paradigmatic problem in algorithmic mechanism design. It's motivated much of the research. Um, and we improved the approximation ratio from logarithmic to 1 minus 1 over e for a large subclass of submodular valuations. I'm going to define the subclass. I'm going to tell you what the subclass is later. But uh, the nice thing is it uh, includes basically uh, all submodular functions we usually see in this context. It doesn't include things that are kind of uh, not smooth enough. But you know, it's a step, right? And again, for combinatorial public projects, we'd get something similar. Um, and it's also one of the paradigmatic problems in the field. We improve the square root of m to 1 minus 1 over e for most submodular functions. Right? For most submodular valuations. And this uh, I did recently. Uh, oh, and this one was with uh, Tim Rafgan and Chichian, and this is by myself. One, one thing can you go back to your yes. This is the. This is the box. 
this is one number is bigger than one, the other is smaller than one. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, are you talking about here? Here and in the next one. Uh, yeah. So this is. Th these are all bigger, right? So uh, I'm taking. Uh, I'm, so, oh, I see. So, uh, one over that. Say, like, negative one. I'm sorry. So, I'm using the uh, common notation approximation algorithms where you use either bigger than one or smaller than one from context. Yeah, my bad. I should, put a, I should have put an inverse to the negative one here. You're right. <clears throat> I have to remember to fix that. All right. So, um, right. So, uh, so, these are some highlights. We get more, there's more results, but this is kind of just a bunch of highlights. Um, so these are big gaps, and we closed them. Uh, and now, we, since we made so much progress in a short period of time, it's good to ask, why were we stuck for so long? And there is, a, there is one idea that, under, that basically underlines this progress. And it's the realization that uh, the fact that we were stuck because uh, people, were focusing on the, um, uh, people were focusing on deterministic mechanisms. They weren't using randomization, where they, uh, uh, they weren't using ma randomized mechanisms. They weren't using uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, use approximation algorithms to compute the allocation, right? Question? I mean, the approximation algorithms were used in the issue that there was no randomization. Or... I'm sorry? You, you said two things. They, were, they weren't using randomization, and they weren't using approximation algorithms? No, no, I, I just said they weren't using algorithm randomization. You're right. Um, that's it. Uh, and uh, there's a good reason for that. Uh, a priori, it's not clear why randomization could help you uh, combine truthfulness and polynomial time. So this is a restricted computational model. And unlike other restricted computational models, like, for example, online algorithms, uh, it's not obvious intuitively why randomization could help you. Why is it that randomization allows you to, to get good incentives and polynomial time, whereas with that randomization, you can't? It's not intuitively clear, right? Um, and as I said, deterministic mechanisms uh, had strong limitations that were backed up by these theorems. And often when people get impossibility results for deterministic mechanisms, uh, some people were thinking, OK, I don't see why randomization could help. Maybe this is fundamental, right? So that's essentially where, why we were stuck. So here's an example of such an impossibility result. There's many more. Uh, Papa Dimitri Shapira and Singer showed that the uh, combinatorial public projects problem, the one where you want to pick k projects to satisfy people, right? Um, they showed that even, this pro even though this problem has a 1 minus 1 over e approximation algorithm, there's no deterministic truthful polynomial time mechanism that gets better than a square root of the number of items approximation. So essentially, there, there were strong impossibility results for uh, deterministic mechanisms. And um, a priori, it's not clear that if you, take away, if you make it uh, deterministic, you, you, get, you would get the 1 minus 1 over e, right? So that's basically my contribution. Um, so here's, the, uh, here's one conceptual contribution. Uh, we identified a class of randomized algorithms that gives us truthful mechanisms that are provably be better than the best uh, deterministic ones. And also developed techniques for using it effectively. And this kind of renewed the hope that we may be able to get general positive results now. Maybe we can get for large classes of problems or many interesting problems. Uh, that we can always do the best, the best approximation ratio uh, uh, via a truthful mechanism. So um, I'm going to basically uh, split up my contributions into, th uh, into three main bullets. Uh, we showed formally for the first time that randomized mechanisms are better than deterministic ones. We looked at a problem called multi-unit auctions with Shahar Dubzinski. And we showed that there's a truthful FP task. I'm not going to define multi-unit auctions. It's basically a variant of combinatorial auctions where the items are identical, right? And then we proved a lower bound that deterministic mechanisms can't do better than half. And this was kind of the first separation between deterministic mechanisms and randomized mechanisms. So this was the first evidence that we should uh, head down the road of designing randomized mechanisms. Um, then the second result I'm going to highlight is joint work with Tim Roughgarden. We showed, that, um, we showed the first black box reduction from algorithm design to dominant strategy truthful mechanism design. Uh, we basically said, looked at a large class of welfare maximization problems and showed that we can always convert an FP task for such a problem to a truthful randomized mechanism that is also an FP task. We remember FP task is an approximation algorithm that uh, is parameterized by an epsilon and gets a 1 minus epsilon approximation. Right? 
Uh, and the class we looked at is called Packing Decision Problems. The Knapsack Public Projects problem is one example, but there's many more, and they model a lot of the interesting welfare maximization problems we usually see. So this result I'm not going to highlight in this talk. I'm going to highlight a third result, which uh, is more recent, hence uh, I like to talk about it more. But I'm gonna t there's one, pa one aspect of this result that I, I definitely do want to mention, because uh, I think many people would find it interesting. The way we prove this is via connection to smooth complexity, smooth complexity, uh, smooth analysis of algorithms. So if you haven't seen plum, uh, smooth complexity or if you haven't seen it in a while, um, here's an informal definition. I'm not going to get into it too much. Uh, a problem, a, a optimization problem has polynomial smooth complexity um, if, even though it may be NP-hard, I can still find you an algorithm that solves the problem exactly maybe runs in exponential time uh, for some inputs, but runs in uh, polynomial time over any kind of uh, small distribution over inputs, right? So uh, in a sense, a problem has polynomial smooth complexity if it's hard in the worst case, but easy in the, in, in the average case where, average is, uh, where I'm using um, average in a very, very um, limited sense. Uh, I say if I have an instance and I perturb it a little bit, now it becomes easy. So a problem has polynomial smooth complexity if, in a sense, the hard instances are measure zero, right? So this was a, a concept uh, first introduced by Spielman and Tang, and it's become very popular. Questions? Right, so if a problem has polynomial smooth complexity, we show that, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. OK, so here's how we prove our black box result. Uh, we, there's a two step, there's, uh, the outline of our proof is two, uh, is two points. Uh, there's an old result that's not due to us uh, by Bayer and Vaki and Rogel and Tang, and they show that if a problem has an FP TAS, then it has polynomial smooth complexity in a rigorous sense that I didn't define very carefully. Um, what we do is the second part. We show that if a uh, problem in the class we consider has polynomial smooth complexity, then it has a uh, truthful FP TAS, truthful randomized FP TAS, right? Um, so, in the same words of what the first result means when you say it has, so in polynomial time you can do, so you randomly perturb the problem and then in polynomial time you can do what? Compute exactly? Compute so there's an, uh, here's what it is. There's an algorithm, an exact algorithm for the problem, that uh, over any uh, uh, perturbed, in, if you take an input and you perturb it, in expectation over the perturbed input, it runs in polynomial time. It's exact on every instance, but it runs in expected polynomial time over any small distribution. Right? Any questions? So yeah, so uh, they go from FP task to polynomial smooth complexity. What we do is we go back. We say, if it has polynomial smooth complexity, then it has a, a truthful FP task. Right? So th that's all I'm going to say about this result. Um, but I'd love to talk about it offline if anybody wants to see it. There's a lot of nice geometry in it. OK, the, the result I'm going to talk about is going to be uh, this uh, uh, third set of results. Um, we introduced a new technique based on convex optimization for designing truthful randomized mechanisms. And uh, we call this technique convex rounding. And it's basically a, a way of rounding linear programs and other mathematical relaxations that uh, gives you truthful mechanisms. So um, essentially, the idea is if you have a linear program, uh, and you have a way of rounding the linear program, it may not, you, you, may, you may not be able to build a, a truthful mechanism on top of that. But I say, if you can make your rounding algorithm to, uh, uh, convex in a sense, now you can. And now you can try to think about whether you can make rounding algorithms with this nice property. Uh, and using these ideas, uh, we uh, made progress on uh, the most studied problems in algorithmic mechanism design, in particular combinatorial auctions and combinatorial public projects. And uh, this is the uh, technique I'm going to focus on in this talk, in the technical portion of this talk. So here's a theorem we, use, we get using this technique. Uh, we show that there's a 1 minus 1 over e truthful mechanism for combinatorial auctions for most submodular valuations. And uh, also for combinatorial public projects, which is uh, uh, the last problem I talked about. Um, also, we get a 1 minus 1 over e approximation for a large subclass of submodular evaluations, improving the best known from square root of uh, number of items. OK, so, um, so now I'm going to uh, start the technical portion of the talk. 
there's going to be two segments of the technical portion of the talk. First, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what randomized mechanisms we're going to design. What are these algorithms that we're going to, randomized algorithms we're going to design, what do they look like? And uh, then I'm going to tell you how to uh, use convex rounding to design them and get good results. Okay, so, so what's, uh, uh, when I say I want to use uh, randomization, what do I really mean? I mean that the uh, process that computes the allocation and the payments basically depends on internal random coins that are be being flipped by the algorithm. And uh, I'm going to say such a mechanism is truthful if uh, when a player doesn't know how I'm going to flip my coins, he maximizes his ex expected utility by telling the truth. Maybe after the coin is flipped, he he is flipped, he regrets what he did. But in expectation, if he doesn't know how I'm going to flip the coin, he's going to tell the truth. It's often called, th these mechanisms are often called truthful in expectation or truthful for risk neutral players if you're uh, an economist. But we're just going to call them truthful loosely. Um, right, so let's remember VCG. Right? VCG is the mechanism that uh, seems to uh, work from an economic perspective, but sometimes doesn't run in polynomial time. So uh, remember, it's this three-step process. You ask for valuations, you find an optimal solution, then you charge externality. Um, here's the idea. I would like to plug in an approximation algorithm here. Sometimes I can't do that because it, what I plug in here it doesn't preserve truthfulness of the whole thing. right? Uh, but there are some special approximation algorithms that I can plug in here, and uh, the whole thing remains truthful, right? And these are the algorithms that I'm going to use. And I'm going to tell you what they look like in a second. These, these, algorithms, are, uh, these, these algorithms are called maximal and distributional range algorithms. It's a, it's a class of approximation algorithms. It's approximation algorithms with special structure, right? Not all approximation algorithms uh, are in this class. In fact, uh, unless you're working in mechanism design, why would you design such, a, such an approximation algorithm? They tend to be harder and uh, less easy to get than uh, other approximation algorithms. Uh, okay, so remember we have a set of, uh, a problem is defined by a feasible set. Let's say my feasible set lies in some Euclidean space. Uh, let's say my feasible set is these uh, black points, right? And uh, I want to also think about distributions over feasible solutions. So when I draw a gray point, I really mean it's a distribution over black points. For example, this uh, gray point right there is, um, this gray point right there, um, if I draw it like this, I'm going to think of it as being the uh, distribution that outputs this black point with 50% and this black point with 50%. Obviously, the, uh, when I draw them like this, it's not clear, it's not unique what the distribution I mean is. But I'm just going to do it as a caricature to just get the intuition across. Um, so once I, um, so I have this feasible set and I have distributions over it. Uh, a distributional range is basically a subset of these distributions over feasible solutions, right? You can also think of it as a set of lotteries over, over the feasible solutions, right? An algorithm is maximal in distributional range if it fixes a distributional range, fixes a set of distributions, and then um, when I say fixes, I mean, it commits to it before it even sees the player evaluations. Before it sees the objective function, it says, I'm only ever going to output a, a solution in this set, right? And then once it gets the objective function, i.e. the player values, it finds the optimal solution in its range. So it's a restricted approximation algorithm. It's an approximation algorithm that commits upfront to how it's going to lose, its how, how it's going to lose optimality. It's going to say, I'm going to commit upfront to only outputting uh, this restricted set of solutions. Um, and once it gets the objective function, it's going to find the best solution in its restricted range. Make sense? Uh, so here's an example of... Um, sorry, that's not... Uh, all right. Uh, so here's an example of, a, uh, of how you would design such a distributional range. So you have a... Remember combinatorial auctions. You have a bunch of items. You want to split them up between players. Um, let's think of a distribution over allocations. Um, I'm going to call a distribution a product lottery if, um, if it's a distribution that I get by uh, the following uh, association. I associate with every item J and a player I a probability that I gets J. And then I assign each item uh, independently according to the probability, right? If there are every, every set of fractions X sub I J for players I and J, defines a different uh, product distribution over allocations, right? 
So every time I give you a set of fractions xi, xi j, and I uh, basically uh, give item each j to uh, each item to a player with the, with the probability, I get a distribution that I'm going to call a product lottery, right? Um, so the set of product lotteries is a set of distributions, so it is a distributional range, but it's not a very useful one because the um, the set of uh, uh, deterministic uh, partitions is also a product lottery if I set these x sub i j's to ones and zeros, right? So essentially, I'm, it's the same problem. It's not, as, it's not any easier. The optimal solution is always a product lottery. So uh, finding the best uh, product lottery is NP hard if the problem is NP hard, right? Uh, and a surprising fact, surprising fact, which I'm going to show you uh, in this talk, is that if I commit up front that no player gets an item with probability more than 1 minus 1 over e, suddenly I put the problem in p. If I tell you, find me the best distribution over solutions uh, where you assign every item uh, independently, uh, but nobody gets anything with more than probability 1 minus 1 over e, that problem is polynomial time solvable. And it's related to the original problem. In, in, a, in a sense, solving this smaller problem uh, uh, exactly gives you 1 minus 1 over e approximation to the original problem. Um, and so now that if I have a, an algorithm that uh, basically commits to a range up front and then finds the optimal solution, uh, I can plug it into VCG to get a truthful mechanism. Why? Well, it's essentially just I defined a different optimization problem that I'm solving optimally. I, so I told you to commit up front to a subset of the feasible solutions, and I'm going to solve exactly on those. So it's basically simply VCG uh, on a smaller problem that I solve optimally. What's the upshot? I reduced truthful mechanism design to designing approximation algorithms of this maximum distributional range variety. And now that I, if I can do this, I don't need to worry about incentives or payments or game theory anymore. It's basically just uh, a restricted computational model where I have to uh, design approximation algorithms with certain structure. Once I do that, everything else uh, is, can be generically uh, taken care of. Make sense? All right. So now, what I, now you know what the, class, what the algorithm I'm going to design look like. They're going to fix a set of distributions over feasible solutions. It's not going to be everything. And then once, it gets, once you see the objective function, you're going to find the best, uh, best solution in the range you committed to up front. OK, so now I'm going to uh, look at combinatorial auctions. I'm going to tell you what this convex rounding technique is and why, how we can use it to get uh, these algorithms of this, of this sort. Remember combinatorial auctions, I have these items, I want to split them up between the players. This is all something we've seen before. Um, like I said, I'm going to assume the player valuation are some modular. Uh, we define, this is the formal definition, it's just diminishing marginal returns. Remember that uh, without truthfulness, there's a 1 minus 1 over e uh, approximation algorithm. And uh, if you haven't seen the, that algorithm is due to von Drack, if you haven't seen it before, uh, there's a much simpler algorithm that's a half approximation, and it's just a greedy algorithm. We basically go through the items one by one, and you give the item to the player who has the most additional benefit from getting it. And um, using the fact that there's diminishing marginal returns, a charging argument uh, of the same sort we usually see with uh, greedy algorithms shows that this is a half approximation. And uh, the 1 minus 1 over e approximation is basically just a fractional version of that. It's a lot more complicated. It's a very nice, brilliant algorithm, but it's basically a fractional version of this greedy descent. OK, now with truthfulness, like I said, the best known is logarithmic due to Dobzinski and Nissan. Um, and now uh, the ch it's been the challenge problem in algorithmic mechanism design for a while to find a constant factor approximation that is truthful. Uh, and here's a theorem that we get. We don't, we don't quite answer it uh, for all submodular valuations, but we come very, very close. We show that for a large subset of submodular valuations, there's a 1 minus over approximation for combinatorial auctions. And uh, this is the best we can get in polynomial time, and it was the first optimal result for combinatorial auctions or restricted valuations. The set of valuations we prove this for is not all submodular functions, like I said. It's the set of call, uh, I'm going to call matrix rank sums. If you, this may ring a bell, but if it doesn't, uh, don't worry about it. Um, 
in this talk, I'm going to prove it for, because, because, pr because proving it for this class is hard, uh, well, difficult, we prove it. But in this talk, I'm going to uh, prove it for a smaller and simpler and more intuitive class of valuations uh, called coverage functions. But why is this interesting? Why is it interesting that I show you that? Well, I claim it's very interesting because uh, coverage, func coverage valuations are basically the canonical example of submodular functions, and they inherit all the algorithmic hardness that, that is true of submodular functions. So I'm not cheating. This is a subclass of submodular functions. We have all the same hardness results. Um, uh, and moreover, every time you, unless you're really, really into submodularity, if you've ever seen an example of submodular functions, it was probably in this class. So let me define what these, uh, what valuations, uh, what coverage valuations look like. Let's say I'm this guy, and there's two items in play, a volleyball and a ping pong paddle. My happiness is basically uh, related to kind of a, a, a measure space of happiness. So, um, so uh, I get a, uh, one unit of happiness if I get to uh, exercise, play, play in the sun. I get one unit of happiness if I get exercise. And I get uh, one unit of happiness if I get to uh, socialize and uh, play sports with uh, people at work. Right? Um, I actually only have two hobbies, volleyball and ping pong, so it's actually very realistic. Um, so with, every, with each one of the items, I associate a subset of my happiness space. Uh, for example, if I uh, get the volleyball, I get to play in the sun because I like to play beach volleyball. And uh, I also get some exercise. If I get the ping pong paddle, I get some exercise and I get to uh, uh, play with my uh, friends at work because there's a ping pong uh, table in the Gates building at Stanford. Um, but um, if I get both of them, uh, I actually um, don't get twice, twice the amount of happiness from exercise. I only, I, only, I only have a fixed amount of time to exercise. So um, I only get one unit of happiness from exercise, whether I get uh, one of these items or both of them, right? So that's, in a sense, it's why it's a coverage function, right? And uh, you know, this is kind of, an, uh, a kind of a caricatured example. But you can think of if you're a company and you're bidding on, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, if, you, if you're kind of a telecommunications company and you're bidding on uh, radio spectrum licenses, you can think of the number of people you get to reach with your advertising. Whereas you don't care if you reach them uh, uh, on two different frequencies. All you care about is the fact that you reach them or not. Right? So that's what a coverage function is. Make sense? Questions? It's going to be very important that you understand what these are. Would you give us a definition of coverage functions? Uh, yes. Uh, I think I just did by a caricature. But here's what it is. A coverage function on a set of items is basically uh, a function that's defined by a, uh, an abstract measure space. And every item maps to a subset of the measure space. And your value for a set of items is the uh, uh, measure of the union of the measure space the, uh, associated with these items. There's absolutely no ambiguity. Either I get something, and I get value 1. And if I cover it 1,000 times, I still just get value 1. Exactly. That's exactly right. More questions? Um, right. So how am I going to design a, a maximum distributional range algorithm for this problem? I could tell you how I do it specifically for combinatorial auctions, but it's actually going to be simpler and more instructive to zoom out for a second and look at approximation algorithms more, more, more abstractly. And this will give you intuition as to why this is a general technique that we can use for other problems. Um, so for, most problem, uh, for many problems in approximation algorithms, the best uh, algorithms we get are based on uh, uh, relaxing the problem into some kind of mathematical relaxation, like a linear program, a semi-definite program, or what have you. Solving this mathematical relaxation, then rounding the fractional solution. Right? Um, and like I said, convex rounding is um, a class of rounding algorithms that uh, when you can design such a rounding algorithm, it, uh, an algorithm that uses this rounding, you can always make it truthful. So let's look at what algorithms based on relaxation and rounding look like. Let's say you have a, an optimization problem where you have a bunch of solutions, and you want to maximize objective v over these solutions. Let's say your objective is linear, right? Uh, so what does this mean? I want to find the black point that goes as far as possible in the direction of v, right? Uh, we see this a lot whenever we can write a problem as a, a encode solutions of a problem as points in Euclidean space, right? 
Maybe this problem is NP-hard. Maybe it's hard for me to find the black dot that's furthest along in the direction of V. But maybe this is easier. So what the, uh, the common thing, relaxation, what it does is you define basically a nice convex set that surrounds your feasible solutions, um, usually a linear program, right, or a polytope. And then you, um, you, you basically find the optimal solution of this linear program. So you go, you'd say, what's the best, what's the best point in this uh, convex set uh, according to the direction v? Well, it's maybe this one, right? And then once you solve this linear program, you round the solution to, a, to, a, to an integer solution. So let's, if I got this, if I uh, got this solution as my optimal solution to the integer program, uh, to the linear program, maybe I round it to this, to this, to this uh, uh, integer solution. If I got uh, this one, maybe I round it here. If I got this solution, maybe, I, maybe my rounding algorithm is uh, randomized. So maybe I output this solution with 50% and this solution with 50%. Right? So this is what uh, algorithms based on relaxation and rounding usually look like. Questions? I assume many of you have seen this kind of thing before. Um, right. So these algorithms generally can't be made truthful, no matter how smart you are about defining the payments. Um, well, then you can say, well, OK, why not? Because solving the linear program is clearly, in a sense, maximal in range or optimal over some problem. right? So why can't we just plug it into the vickery clark groves mechanism and get the right thing? And that's a good point. And you're right. But uh, the problem is the rounding step. The rounding step uh, is uh, not structured enough. Uh, is, is so unstructured that it's, it's, it's impossible to define um, uh, payments that make the whole thing truthful. And this is why. Imagine that you solve the linear program optimally, and then you round the solution that you get. Maybe uh, after you round it, the rounding loses a lot. right? Maybe it loses the whole approximation ratio. You, you end up with a solution that's, say, 1 minus 1 over e worse than the uh, solution of the linear program. Uh, whereas you would have rather uh, gotten a suboptimal solution to the linear program uh, and then rounded that, and then maybe the rounding there is not so bad. So in a sense, if I'm a player who, who even is already on board, if I'm already on board and I want to help you maximize social welfare, uh, I would still want to lie to lead you to an optimal solution to the, to the linear program so that uh, the round, uh, to exploit the fact that the rounding algorithm is actually not so bad there. Make sense? So, um, you need to pay that to, to, to a suboptimal because... A suboptimal solution to the, uh, the linear program, which is actually, does not lose too much in rounding. I'm sorry, did I say optimal? Okay, <laughs> my bad. Uh, all right, so um, in a sense, rounding changes the quality of a solution in an unstructured way. Uh, and this unstructured change in quality of the solution uh, is usually impossible to compensate for using payments. And this can be proved, but I'm not going to get into it. Okay, so here's a simple solution I'm going to propose. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to propose that you try and solve an optimization problem that a priori looks unsolvable. I'm going to ask you to suspend disbelief. Imagine if um, so, okay, so usually we solve the LP and then we round the solution we get. I'm going to instead incorporate the rounding into the objective function. So remember, R is a, is a map from, fractional points, uh, from the fractional solutions, this polytope P, to the uh, actual solutions, to the, for example, the partitions of the items. And this map is randomized, right? So let's say I, let's say I ask you to find me the, um, the, the, the fractional point X that has the best rounded outcome. Uh, I want to find the, the, the point x such that v transposed times the rounding of x is maximized, right? I'm, I'm going to put an expectation here because uh, this, this function is random, right? Um, so in a sense, I'm incorporating the rounding into the objective function. And I'm asking you to find the fractional solution with the best rounded image. Make sense? Um, Here's the insight. It's a very simple insight, but it's going to be very powerful. Finding the optimal solution of this uh, optimization problem, and then just sampling the rounding algorithm there, is clearly going to give you a maximum distributional range algorithm. Why? You're simply optimizing over all distributions over solutions that could possibly arise by rounding a fractional solution, by definition. Make sense? Questions? 
Optimize x star. I'm sorry, so if x star is the optimal of this optimization problem. But this rounding function, r of x, mm -hmm. that is also within your control, right? You can change r. Right. Change I'm saying, let's say I give you an r, a certain r, for which you can solve this optimization problem. So I, I'm sorry, I should have said I'm uh, fixing an r in this slide. More questions? So yes, if I can solve this optimization problem, here's a, here's, a, here's a maximum distribution range algorithm. Solve this optimization problem, then round the solution that you get. By definition, the solution I found is the thing that's going to give me the best rounded result. So this algorithm is going to be maximum over its range, right? OK, so how do we use this idea? Let's remember combinatorial auctions. Here's a fractional relaxation of combinatorial auctions. Uh, I did, uh, for every player i and item j, I'm going to make a variable x sub i j that tells me whether uh, player i gets item j. Right? For every item, I don't want to give it to more than one person. Right? That's the first constraint. And uh, everything is positive uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, here, for example, here's a, here's a part of a feasible solution of this, uh, of this uh, fractional relaxation. Let's say this volleyball, half of it goes to this guy, quarter goes to this lady, and a quarter goes to the other guy, right? And if you have a bunch of, if you have fractions for every one of these items that sum to one, then you get a solution to this kind of rela fractional relaxation, right? Um, how would you round such a thing? If I give you a solution to this, uh, uh, to this uh, if I give you a point in this polytope, how would you round it? The obvious thing to do is to basically do the, assign every item independently according to these probabilities. For example, for the volleyball, the obvious thing to do is to give it to this guy with probability half, this lady with probability half, quarter, and this guy with probability quarter. And do it such that you don't, uh, you don't do it like uh, by sweeping, in a sense, right? So that you only give it to one person. Yes? Sorry, what's the objective function? Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, sec I'm intentionally suppressing that. I'm intentionally suppressing it, and it's going to be the expected of the rounding, right? I'm going to define the objective function in reference to the rounding, right? So, okay, so I could round such a, a fractional point uh, using the obvious way. In other words, I'm going to uh, output the product lottery with these marginal probabilities. That's a rounding function. Um, but uh, like we said before, uh, finding the best result of this rounding function must be NP-hard. Why? Because if these are all ones or zeros, then I could, I could, I could always get uh, every deterministic partition of the items by setting these to ones or zeros. So if I ask you to find the best possible thing I could get by rounding, it's no easier than the original problem. So I'm going I'm to need to do something smarter, right? Um, OK, that's actually what I should have said on this slide. Um, right, so uh, according to that, I want to find the best product lottery. Like I said, we, have to, we can set them ones or zeros. So uh, it's NP hard. I should have said this on this slide. I apologize. Uh, all right. So, OK. So clearly, that rounding algorithm is not, this rounding algorithm is not what we want. Um, and in fact, this difficulty of, uh, solve, of finding the best rounding out, rounded outcome is, is general. We see it everywhere in approximation algorithms if we try to do this. Because all natural rounding algorithms usually round integer solutions to themselves. In a sense, the integer points of the polytopes are, are usually fixed points of the rounding map, right? If, you, if I give you a fractional spanning tree, you round it a certain way. But if, I, if the fractional spanning tree is actually integer, you're not going to give me another one, right? You're going to give me the same one if you're running a, a, a normal approximation algorithm. So. Uh, yeah, so we need something that's, uh, that, that breaks this property, that breaks the property that integer points are fixed points. So um, we're going to design better behaved rounding algorithms that break this property and give us uh, a tractable optimization problem. OK, so um, here's, here's the uh, class of rounding algorithms that, are gonna, uh, that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to call a rounding algorithm R, a convex rounding algorithm, if the, expect, if the objective function of this optimization problem is concave in the variables of a fractional solution. In other words, um, 
the expected value you get by rounding a fractional solution is a concave function of, that, of, 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 of the variables of the solution, right? If I give you a rounding algorithm R that's, con that's convex, um, this whole thing is a convex optimization problem that I can solve with the ellipsoid method. So now, the problem of if I can give you a rounding algorithm that's, that, 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 that if I can give you a convex rounding algorithm for uh, uh, combinatorial auctions, finding the best result of the rounding over all, um, over all uh, uh, fractional solutions is a convex optimization problem that I can solve in polynomial time. No reason to believe, a priori, there's no reason to believe that interesting uh, rounding algorithms like this exist because, uh, well, they must look unnatural. They must round integer solutions to uh, different integer solutions, which is kind of strange. But they do exist, and here it is for combinatorial auctions. I'm going to call this Poisson rounding. Um, and here's what, it, usually what you would do for, if you're just thinking of an obvious rounding algorithm, you'd give the volleyball to this player with probably the x12 and so on and so forth. But instead of giving uh, every item to the player with the, with the fraction, that he, with the fraction that, of the item that he has, if, instead of giving item j to player i with probability, with probability x sub i j, give it to him with probability 1 minus e to the minus x sub i j. Seems weird. Why would you ever do this? This is less than or equal to x sub i j, right? Um, why would you do this? And um, there's really uh, uh, no intuition better than seeing the proof. Um, so these numbers add up to less than one, so with some probability the item is not allocated. Exactly. With some probability, I will, I will throw an item in the trash. And that's essentially, you can think of it as a way of punishing people in such a way to align the punishment with the report so that they want to tell the truth. That's exactly right. Right? So why is Poisson rounding convex? Why does it give me a concave uh, objective function? Um, like I said, I'm going to prove it for coverage functions. Here's the, here's the, here's the proof. Fix a, a, fr a fractional solution, basically, uh, where x sub i j is a fraction of the item j given to player i. Uh, Poisson rounding gives j to i with probability 1 minus e to the minus x sub i j. Now, um, I'm going to set up some notation. For player i, let s sub i be the set of items he gets, right? And I want to show you that the expected of the social welfare is concave in the variables, right? So this is a random variable um, that uh, uh, is the result of the rounding. And the rounding is defined according to these x sub ij's. Make sense? Uh, bilinearity of expectation and the fact that a sum of two convex functions is concave, all I need to show you is uh, for, that for one player, their expected value over what they get is a concave function of the, of the fractional solution. Right? So I'm going to break it up into a player by player sense. So let's remember uh, this player who, uh, uh, where there's a volleyball and a ping pong paddle in play. Let's say uh, the fractional solution give, uh, gives him x1 fraction of the volleyball and x2 fraction of the ping pong paddle. Let's say, let's say he gets x1 fraction of the volleyball and x2 fraction of the ping pong paddle. Uh, and then we have this following coverage pattern, right? Like we said before, what's, what's my value? If I'm this player, what's my value? My value is the probability uh, that I get to play in the sun, plus the probability that I get to exercise, plus the probability that I get to play at work, right? Um, where I, I get these two uh, if I get the volleyball, and I get these two if I get the um, ping pong paddle, and I get the three if I get both, right? Um, so it's sufficient, by linearity of expectation, it's sufficient to show that each probability here is concave. So let's look at them one by one. Let's look at the easy ones first. What's the probability that I get to play in the sun? Well, it's the probability that I get the volleyball, because the volleyball is the only thing that allows me to play in the sun. And that's 1 minus e to the minus x1, which is a concave function of x1. Similarly, what's the probability that I get to play at work? It's the probability that I get the ping pong paddle which is 1 minus e to the minus x2, again concave. The interesting case is uh, this one, which is covered by two things, right? What's the probability that I get exercise? Well, I get exercise whether I get the volleyball, paddle, uh, uh, volleyball or the ping pong paddle, um, which is 1 minus the probability that I get neither. 
Well, what's the probability that I don't get the volleyball? It's e to the minus x1. What's the probability that I don't get the ping pong paddle? It's e to the minus x2. So it's 1 minus e to the minus x1 times e to the minus x2, which uh, if you, and then you can write it 1 minus e to the minus x1 plus x2. And if you remember any con convex analysis, this is a concave function. And I claim that uh, this is a proof by example, and this is going to be general, no matter what the coverage pattern is. Yes, it's going to be 1 minus e to the minus x1 times e to the minus x2 times e to the minus x3. It all comes out. Make sense? And if uh, you don't remember the composition of convex functions, this is the, um, the, uh, this is the composition of a, an affine function with a concave function. So. <clears throat> when you have more com complex combinatorial structures, you always just get this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get 1 minus e to the minus some of the variables of the things that have that, item, that, have that part of the measure space, right? That cover that part of the measure space, right? Um, right. I claim this is, this is general. And you said you would give us a proof that works for things that are slightly more complicated than coverage functions? Or oh, no, I didn't say I was going to give it. I said we do prove it there. Uh, that's a slightly more general class that includes uh, matroid rank functions and things like that. But is the composition of the proof identical to this one? Uh, no, it's actually, it's actually, we have to do a lot more work. We use matroid contraction and things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> right. OK, so now uh, here's a second lemma. Uh, I claim that if you round this way, you're, gonna get, you're not going to lose too much in the approximation ratio. You're going to lose at most 1 minus 1 over e. The proof of this lemma is not so interesting. So I'm just going to give you some very rough intuition. Um, to show that uh, because we're maximizing over the set of outputs of the rounding algorithm, it suffices to show that I can o there's always one, a fractional solution that I can round to get something within 1 minus 1 over e. Um, and uh, in fact, it's not too hard to see that if I round the integer solution corresponding to the optimal solution, uh, I'm not, it's not going to get much worse. So there's always something that's not much worse in your range. So you're finding the best output in your range, you're fine. Why is it that rounding, rounding any integer point doesn't make it too much worse? Uh, well, it's by diminishing marginal returns. Uh, if, you ha if you have submodular evaluations, it implies that um, uh, you're, losing, you're losing everything with probability at most 1 over e, one over e right? And uh, since there's diminishing marginal returns, the aggregate loss is going to be 1 over e. Um, and yeah, and that's essentially the intuition, but it's not very interesting. Um, OK, so using these two lemmas, we get the theorem. We get that there's a 1 minus 1 over e approximate randomized mechanism for combat trial auctions. And uh, yeah, this is some stuff I said about it before. Um, and also, we can use this technique to solve the, uh, the third problem in, in my examples, combat trial public projects. We get a similar result. All right, so that's it. Uh, to summarize, positive uh, progress in algorithmic mechanism design was lacking. Uh, we didn't have good deterministic mechanisms, and it was not clear how to use randomness. So uh, my contribution is uh, developing techniques that allow us to use randomness in a way that we can uh, reconcile truthfulness and computation. Um, and we get a bunch of positive results, uh, one that's general for uh, problems with NFPTAS and some general techniques as well, like convex rounding. And, uh, Future directions are um, how, how far do these ideas go? Do we get general positive results? Remember, the holy grail is we, can always, we want to always convert uh, an approximation algorithm to a truthful mechanism without losing in the approximation. Uh, can we do this for nice, large classes of problems? That's an interesting question. That's, I think, the most interesting question for future work here. Um, and philosophically, that really asks the question, uh, is getting truthfulness without loss in polynomial time computation? Uh, is computation and incentive compatibility, are they, are they uh, at odds with each other or are they compatible? And that's, that, that's I think, a very interesting philosophical question. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Yes? So <laughs> the first thing is if all the x, i, j are very small, then the approximation ratio gets better? Yes. Um, about the randomization, so in the practical implementation, this will be a barrier because uh, people might be worried about 
volatility there, they might not be risk neutral. Mm -hmm. Is there, and what happens if uh, players engaged in your uh, randomized auction try to hedge by placing the, the so you have this auction all set up, mm -hmm. every person has a lottery and and then say they um, they then try to take their lottery and go to uh, maybe the auctioneer or someone who is risk neutral and replace that lottery by a deterministic payment. So you're really asking you're you're really asking uh, does does these ideas work when there's uh, no risk neutrality? And the answer is no. And that's a very interesting direction to see what what. Does risk neutrality make things a lot? Does does risk averseness or risk seeking behavior uh, make uh, make this problem a lot harder? And I don't know. Let's. No, we asked about the specific thing. Yeah. If people, I suppose there is some risk neutral mm -hmm. player around. Say the the auctioneer has big resources and he's risk neutral mm -hmm. in the range we're talking. And then can the players and there are players that other players are say risk averse. The players are risk averse. Right. The auctioneer is risk neutral. Can the players then go to the auctioneer and try to um, hedge their bets so that replace their lotteries by their expectations? Um, I'm not sure. What do you mean by replace their lotteries by their by, by by definition, uh, they can't, right? By definition, of the problem. Are you are you allowing kind of side transfers side or something side like that? Yes, transfers. allowing side transfers. Um, that I don't know. I'll think about that. Um, According to the mo according to the mo according to the model where I just designed a mechanism and this is the uh, and this is what the auctioneer is going to do, they would have no incentive to change. Whether you if you expand the model, uh, that's something that I don't know. Whether, for example, you, they might want to hedge between each other, that's also a different interesting question. I mean, what I'm, I'm just trying to understand is this distinction you have between the deterministic and the randomized. Mm -hmm. yeah. so so if the players are allowed to hedge, you know, via side payments with the auctioneer, then they're, uh, although what they get back is random in the sense that they don't know if they'll get the volleyball but, or some money. But, but, but um, so what is the utility model of the auction? So you're, you're, you're going to assume that the auctioneer has a utility, which is what? So you, when you say hedge with the auctioneer, uh, you're, I assume you have a concept of whether the auctioneer would like to participate in a side payment as well, right? Right. So for, for <laughs> right. So. So if you assume the auctioneer's uh, utility is his payment, right? Then, um, then he's trying to maximize revenue. Then this things fall apart, right? Because this is not a revenue maximizing thing. So the answer, short answer, is uh, no. Uh, using these ideas. <clears throat> Other questions? All right.